Thank you everyone for coming. I'm Dr. DeWitt. For those of you who might not know, we're going to talk about the wonderful film Forks Over Knives and the research behind it. And there uh, are some interesting people that actually don't think there is any research behind it, which is interesting, but we'll talk about that momentarily. So the average American today carries an extra 23 pounds, which can be pretty hefty. As you know, Dr. Bergman lost at the early stages about 25 pounds and that's that's quite a bit to be carrying around 460,000 American women die from heart disease and stroke this year almost half a million 215,000 new cases of prostate cancer every year an unprecedented number of type 2 diabetes in our kids no less than 40% of Americans are obese today, according to the BMI regulations. At least half of Americans are taking some form of prescription drug, and we know that it's more than that, sadly. Lipitor is the most prescribed drug in the world, and as I mentioned before, they uh, had a gentleman in the UK that wanted to actually give statin drugs away <coughs> at McDonald's so that the people that had the the high fat diets that they believed would cause increased cholesterol, they could just go ahead and shortcut it and get it the statin drugs to keep it from causing any problems, but it would also cause spontaneous tendon rupture and glaucoma, so it's kind of a, a bad deal there, and luckily he got shot down, so to speak. Shut down, I should say. One in five American four-year-olds are considered to be obese. Four years old. I didn't, I just found that amazing, and I think a big part of that is we're not getting out, we're not getting active, playing outside, we're just sitting on our computer, on our cell phone, playing the games. Even the four-year-olds have cell phones, I guess, nowadays. Some of them do. But, um, and our diet, which is what we're going to talk about today. That's another factor. But if we were more active, we wouldn't have these problems. This is a really sad statistic. This is the first generation where the kids are actually not expected to live as long as their parents did because of all the horrible processed foods out there and lack of exercise. We spend $2.2 trillion on health care every year in America, which is five times more than the defense budget. You would think we'd be the healthiest people, the healthiest country in the industrialized world, but that is not the case. We're sicker than ever. We're in the bottom part of the country or of the world as far as health goes. Because we're treating the <coughs> symptoms and treating sickness, we're not treating the, the cause and the actual things that will help prevent people getting sick. This was a great quote. There's no money in people that are either dead or people that are healthy. The, pe the money is in the people that are kind of alive, sort of, but have chronic diseases such as diabetes, etc. That's where they can get you in and you have to take your medications every month and just it just adds up, adds up, adds up. Every 60 seconds a person in America is killed by heart disease. So in the time we do this presentation that's going to be at least 20 to 30 people that have died just from heart disease. 1,500 people a day die from cancer. So that's a million people every year killed by heart disease and cancer. And these are all preventable diseases, which we're going to talk about. We're going to get into the specifics in a minute. I'm just setting the stage. So one out of three Americans born today will develop diabetes in their lifetime. It's not a very good percentage, but that also goes back to the, the generation that's not going to live as long as their parents. We're so overstimulated with our caffeine from Starbucks, our energy drinks, and our sugar that we've masked our chronic fatigue. So people feel like they can't get going, and there's a gentleman on the movie, or in the movie, that had to drink two Red Bulls, two Cokes, just to get going before he could even function in the morning. This was before he changed his diet. Could there be a single solution to all of these problems? Someone has to stand up and say the answer is not in another pill. Because we're so over-medicated, it's ridiculous, and obviously it's not working. The way they have it set up now, it's not working. The answer is a whole foods, plant-based diet. And that sounds a little drastic. I know some people that are used to eating protein and you have to have meat and you can't get enough meat from a vegetarian diet, but there's actually a cookbook involved here that is one of the products that we're going to give away 
that explains how in four weeks you can gradually wean yourself off all animal products, including dairy, cheese, milk, and get to a whole food plant-based diet. Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine. And that's where the title of the movie comes in, Forks Over Knives, because the forks represent what you're putting in your mouth, and the knife is a scalpel for surgeries. So you want to avoid that. <laughs> so the scientist involved in this was Colin Campbell. He grew up on a dairy farm back in Virginia, back when milk was considered nature's perfect food, and you had all the commercials on TV, drink milk, and you got to have your milk. You, once your babies get weaned, you need to give them cow's milk because it's going to keep them nice and strong. He studied animal nutrition and biochemistry at Cornell University, and the animal nutrition was really important because he wanted to learn how to feed the cattle and the pigs, etc., so that they could have the most produced uh, meat and milk so that would be the most nutritious for people. And he actually is on board with this plant-based diet, so it's really interesting what he discovered. Fascinating gentleman. So he went to the Philippines in 1960, and his whole purpose of that was to get them to eat more protein. Well, it wasn't cost effective to actually give them all meat to eat, so they got plant source protein from soybeans and um, regular beans, things like that. And while he was out there, he discovered that the, there were kids from the more affluent families that were actually getting liver cancer, which is unheard of at such a young age, but it was because they were eating more um, meat and animal products. So he thought that was interesting. And then he came across this, it was a really important study in India that they exposed rats to carcinogenic uh, substances which cause cancer and then would feed them a diet. One group had 20% casein and the other group had 5% casein. And casein is an amino acid that's found in milk. And the 20% group, they had a huge spike in the amount of cancer clusters that would form. And the 5% group, it actually never, they never had any cancer clusters form. And he actually repeated this test in the study later on and he kept one group, there weren't any, more than one group, it was just the one group at 20% casein with the same exposure to the cancer, and they would get an increased amount, but then after three weeks, he would drop that entire group down to 5% casein, and the amount of cancer clusters would actually drop. So it showed that casein, controlling the amount of casein that you brought in to your system, could sh turn on or turn off the cancer gene, or the cancer-producing agents. In the 1970s, at the same time, fast food restaurants were booming. It's when KFC and Wendy's and McDonald's, and as a result of that, according to these studies, the cases of cancer also increased during that time. So this is a chart of the two studies we were talking about a second ago. So this top one here, the 5%, they never had any cancer clusters, but then with the 20%, it just totally gradually spiked up after three weeks and after six weeks it just kept more and more and more cancer clusters were found in the rats as time went by but in here you have a spike with the twenty percent and then they cut it down to the five percent casein so then there was less less cancer here then it goes back up again when they were at the twenty percent casein and then back down and we're going to go into it a little bit later as to as to how do you get the calcium that you need that you believe you have to have from milk and dairy products there's ways to do that because we believe that if you don't get enough calcium, you're going to have osteoporosis. But that's not necessarily the case. We also talked about, um, or he talked about cancer risks. These are cancer cells. And you can inherit the, the genetic risk of potentially getting cancer, but based on your diet, you can determine if those cancer cells are going to proliferate or if they're just going to stay dormant and not actually ever activate. And that's all based on casein and animal products based on the casein study we saw before. The other gentleman involved was another very intelligent New York doctor, Caldwell Esselstyn, who was just up here a week or two ago speaking about this specific uh, study and film. He was raised on a dairy and beef farm in upstate, upstate New York. So both of these are MDs and PhDs that you were grown, were raised in a farm type community and environment where they believe that animal products were actually the best way to make a living and to help Americans. But then he started to realize, um, as he specialized in breast cancer research and actually doing <coughs> mastectomies, et cetera, at the Cleveland Clinic, he realized that he wasn't actually preventing anybody from getting the breast cancer, and that's what he really wanted to get more involved with. He was tired of doing all the surgeries. I mean, he was happy to help people but it was really difficult for him 
to, to not uh, be able to prevent it in the first place because he realized through some of his nutritional studies that there were ways to prevent it from happening. He looked back to Japan in 1958 and there were only 18 prostate cancer deaths in 1958. And in America, there was a huge discrepancy because, yeah, we were twice as big as Japan back then, but we had over 14,000 prostate cancer deaths. And he couldn't understand why that was. And it turns out that it was all based on their diet, because in Japan, they eat mostly rice and vegetables and not nearly as much meat. The meat they do eat is usually fish, which is healthier, but even the uh, amounts of feet of uh, meat that they eat are smaller portions, so there's not as much casein, not as much dairy. This was a really interesting study as well that he came across in Norway during World War II. The Germans invaded right up here where the Nazi flag is, and this, this is actually a, a mortality chart from circulatory diseases, from uh, heart disease, coronary artery disease. So when the Nazis invaded Norway, they took all the livestock, so all the cows, all the pigs, they took for the soldiers to feed the soldiers, so there was no meat to eat. So then they had to go to a more plant-based diet because there was, there was no other food to eat. And you can see the mortality just dropped off drastically. And then right here around 1944, 1945, after the Nazis left, they got their cows and pigs back. And you can just see it's, it's amazing how direct, what a direct relation they have there. And the mortality rate started going back up. So they felt like, oh, I'm getting more food, I'm eating the meat like I'm supposed to. But in reality, they, in, the mortality rates increased. The U.S. versus Kenya back in the 1970s, he also found that you were 82 times less likely to get breast cancer in Kenya than you were in America. And that also was based on the fact that they didn't have a lot of meat, they ate a lot of rice, a lot of vegetables, and that was actually helping to keep their cancer rates low. The dietary cholesterol, people always worry about cholesterol, it's the actual cholesterol that we ingest that, go, that accumulates in your arteries which can lead to the hardening of the arteries or the arteriosclerosis, which is the plaque that forms in the artery. And he had a fascinating discovery that he realized based on this. This is an interesting slide. Which They talk about how doing a plant-based diet is extreme. Well, which one is more extreme, to have your chest cracked open, or as he, as he put it, to have your chest divided and your heart exposed and an artery taken from your leg and put it onto your heart? Or is it more extreme to just eat vegetables? So this is the scalpel versus the fork. And my wife has actually had three of these surgeries. That's not my wife, by the way. <laughs> but uh, my wife has had three of these surgeries, and it's, uh, it's, it's pretty dramatic. It was a congenital thing, so it's, it's different than the diet. But... It's, it's really extreme. They had 500,000 coronary artery bypass surgeries a year. That's to this day still 100,000, so that's $50 billion spent just on bypass surgeries. And that's all preventable through diet. This is a study that he did. He had 24 patients that he had asked for that he wanted to change their diet, give them a small amount of animal uh, protein and a tiny amount of uh, statin drugs to control their cholesterol. Five of the people had been told they weren't going to live throughout the year and uh, so they were quite a bit sicker than he expected but his results were pretty interesting. Six of them dropped out after five years but they had all of them had lived past that one year. They dropped out, they didn't pass away, they dropped out. Four had stopped the progression of disease and another four had actually reversed their coronary artery disease just based on their diet alone. And there were actually 12 that lived for two decades after this study started. They stayed on the diet. 12 of these 24 people were alive 20 years later when that was definitely not expected and they had been told they weren't going to live for very long. They had been given very grim uh, prognosis. One of them actually was told that you need to prepare for the worst and she said are you telling me I need to go sit in a wheelchair or not in a wheelchair but in a rocking chair and just wait to die and he said basically yeah and she's still alive 20 years later wow. so it, it shows how much they, they just don't know what they don't know they don't know that diet is such an important factor so this is one of the things that Dr. Esselstyn discovered was that this is inside one of our arteries we have these endothelial cells and when we're young it can cover eight to ten tennis courts if you spread them out and what they secrete is nitric oxide, which lubricates and dilates the arteries so it keeps them nice and smooth so that the cholesterol doesn't stick on the lining. And it also helps the blood to flow 
more easily and it dilates the artery as well during exercise so you get more oxygen to your muscles and you just function better. He also discovered that when you eat uh, processed foods, animal products, that it actually kills these endothelial cells so it gets all brown and, and, and kind of placked up in there and it can't secrete the nitric oxide as easily and so then instead of having enough to cover eight to ten tennis courts you only have enough to cover maybe one or two. But if you change your diet because of the way the body is, it's such an amazing structure that if you change your diet and eat more plant-based foods, you can actually reverse that process, re release all of the plaque that's in the system, it'll break down, get reabsorbed, and then the endothelial cells will start to produce the nitric oxide again. And this was kind of scary as well. Erectile dysfunction is one of the first indicators of coronary artery disease. It's kind of like the, the canaries in the coal mines. They have them down there to make sure that there's not any poisonous gases or anything in the coal mines. And uh, if something happens to the canary, they have to get everybody out of there. Something like this happens, that's something you need to really be seriously concerned about and change your diet to help. There was an, there's an older gentleman in this that was really funny. He said he was in his, I, think, I believe he was 67 and said, uh, yeah, it's interesting because all of the men that were in the study of the 24 people said that, uh, uh, he, he was a Chinese gentleman, he was really funny because he was sad because he'd had a couple of open heart surgeries because he had a heart attack. And uh, he said when, when a young gentleman sees a young girl, you know, he, he gets excited, you know, physically and he's like, I like to say he, he, he ra raises the flag. And uh, he said all the guys in the study were still able to do that in their 60s and 70s. All because of increased circulation. But all these problems are caused from, in the early 1900s, we ate about 100 pounds of animal protein and meat, but in 2007 we'd almost doubled that to 220 pounds. Refined sugar here in the early 1900s, it's not even 50 pounds per person, this is per year, but then it was almost up to 150 by 2007, and the dairy one is amazing, and once again, it's almost like the prescription drug as well, all of the marketing for Got Milk and all the celebrities they have that, that tell you that milk is one of the best things to drink, we have almost or over doubled the amount that we had in the early 1900s of dairy products, cheeses and milks that we eat. And I mean, it's just insane. They, talk, they have all the celebrity endorsements. They talk about osteoporosis and how you have to have your calcium. And so everybody always assumes, well, it must be milk. I need to drink more milk. They don't mention the casein at all. So we need to make sure we don't have any packaged food. If it comes in a package, don't eat it. Uh, Thomas Edison had this great quote that the doctor of the future will no longer treat the human frame with drugs, but rather will cure and prevent disease with nutrition. And that's all we're doing. It's real simple. It's a lot like chiropractic. You keep the spine in alignment, the nervous system is the master system and controls the entire body. If you keep that in alignment, your body's going to take care of itself. You put the right foods in, your body's going to take care of itself. It's not it's not complicated, it's not easy, it's simple, but it's, but it's not easy. This was a really interesting reason they said, because basically they were saying, you know, it's not our fault 100% that we, we've gotten so out of control as far as obesity goes in, in America. It's called the pleasure trap. You have sensors on the outside of your stomach here represented in blue that when you eat something, this is uh, plant products here on the left, it actually measures how much your stomach stretches and sends a signal to your brain to let you know that you're full. And then you have the purple sensors on the inside that also measures the caloric density in what you've eaten and so it lets you know how rich the food is that you've had. So right here, 500 calories of the plant product, it's stretched out the stomach, sends a signal to the brain, it says we're full, so then you stop eating and you feel, you feel full. But you have processed food, and these are all 500 calories of each of these. So 500 calories of the processed food you get a little bit of stretch, it's not quite as, as calorie dense, and you, you don't get the signal to your brain that says you're full, so then you keep eating, and then you end up overeating, and to get the same feeling with the processed foods, you have to eat at least two or three times the amount of food. And with oil, that's almost, I mean, it's just all fat, 500 calories barely has any reaction at all, so basically that's if you're eating donuts, you don't ever really get full, you just keep eating and can just eat them all day long. And that's the danger of the pleasure trap, so to speak, where it just feels good, it tastes good, it's great, it's giving you a good feeling, but you're not ever actually feeling full. And those things also you can eat really quickly, and the faster you can eat, your brain has to have a chance to catch up to let you know that you're full. That's one of the reasons they tell you to slow down when you're eating, chew your food, which is another benefit of the plant-based products, because you have to chew them or you'll choke, because it's got a lot of fiber in there. 
So, China, the premier of China back in 1974 actually got diagnosed with cancer, decided he wanted his country to learn all about cancer. So from 73 to 75, he had 650,000 researchers go back and track the mortality rates of several different kinds of cancers and actually tracked 880 million subjects, which it was the biggest study ever and probably will ever be since, on what causes cancer and just the different uh, correlates they had between diet and cancer. And this came out with the Cancer Atlas. So this is China and you have different colored areas of different, um, say this might be esophageal cancer and these different regions, different counties in China, some of them had a 400 fold increase in cancer for that particular type of cancer compared to another region and it was all based on diet. So then uh, Dr. Campbell came in, found this study and he said okay, he worked with one of the doctors in China took 367 variables, diet and health related variables, picked 65 of those Chinese counties, got 350 workers in each of the, and they were rural counties because their, their diet was more consistent, and they had 6,500 subjects. And they ended up in 1990 coming up with 94,000 correlations between diet and disease. And they had to be statistically significant, so for them it meant that if there were 20 variables um, they, it had to have at least 19 pointing in one particular direction of those 20 variables and then they would count that and they had 94,000 of those that indicated that this was the case and it was all based on a plant-based diet to, to stay away from the cancer. And it was all types of cancer, esophageal cancer, prostate cancer, ovarian cancer. So the study was so huge the original China Atlas and the China study which I'm giving away a copy of the China study to some lucky member of the group, um, was actually written up in the New York Times and it said that the, it was the most comprehensive large study ever undertaken of the relationship between diet and the risk of developing disease. And so this is when Dr. Eselston, they've been working separately, and Dr. Campbell, he was the scientist that was studying the biochemistry of it, and Dr. Eselston was more of the clinician that was working actually in the hospital with the actual patients and he had the 24 patients that he was working with on their diet he read this and and tweaked their diet um, that he was working with and cut out all dairy products as well and that really had a great result as far as their increased vitality and decrease in the amount of uh, cancer that they had so back to the question of what about calcium you have to have milk to have calcium and if you don't, you're going to have osteoporosis. Well, if you have osteoporosis, one of the biggest indicators of that is hip fractures in, in elderly people. So they tracked hip fractures. In the U.S., you can see we have, we're taking a whole bunch of calcium down here, but we had the most hip fractures more than New Zealand, Holland, Hong Kong, Singapore. We had a bunch of hip fractures, but, but that doesn't make sense. If we're having all that calcium, why are we having hip fractures? It, if that's the magical mineral that we need, why is that happening? Well, what's happening is because we consume so much animal products that it makes our body systemically acidic. And when your body is acidic, it needs calcium to um, neutralize that acid. So it makes calcium bicarbonate, which is just basically an antacid. And so it, it leaches that calcium out of your skeleton, out of your bones, and that's what is weakening our system and makes our osteoporosis such a, a bad incident, a high incident of that here. And so that was the scariest thing for me is, and, and, and trust me, it's hard for me because I've eaten, I grew up on steak three, three times a week back in Arkansas. That's all we ever had, steak and potatoes. So it, it's a gradual process, but... I mean, it's just obvious. It, the facts are there. The research has been done at excess that if you're going to eat animal products, there are a lot of factors that you're going to have to really think about because there's a lot of side effects that result from that, a lot of consequences, I should say, because you have more animal products, you're going to be more acidic. It doesn't matter how much milk you drink. It's still going to leach the calcium from your bones, going to make your bones weak, and then it's going to also cause the casein in the dairy products is going to cause any cancer cells that you might have to proliferate and increase your risk of actually developing cancer. This is another really scary thing. Sudden death is often the first and only indicator that you have any coronary artery disease at all. You might feel fine and then all of a sudden you just have a massive heart attack and die. 
So wouldn't you rather take some proactive steps and, and change your diet, even if it's just a little bit at first, to maybe instead of getting a double cheeseburger, you get a regular cheeseburger. Or if you have some vegetarian options when you're at the restaurant, order that instead, just to try it. And then eventually you can retrain your taste buds and your brain to eat healthier. So because of that, I'm, I'm asking that you'll share with the people that you love and your family members the, the information that you've seen here. We're actually going to have a showing. I'm not exactly sure when it's going to be of the actual movie, Forks Over Knives. And uh, we, we'll have a question and answer session after that as well. But it's, it's really important. I, I have gotten my parents to eat more fish now. That's something that they've really tried to change. But it's, I mean, my dad's, he, he's old school. He wants the steak still every, every day just about. But at least he switches to fish. But fish, you also have to worry about mercury and things like that. But baby steps, like I said, fish is better than steak. So, so that's good. But anyway, I appreciate, appreciate you listening. We're going to have a drawing here in a minute. And our special for this month is $25. Um, bring your friends, family in, help them. We'll give them advice on their diet as well, and then we can get them checked out to find out if they have any misalignments in their spine, because if you have your spine in alignment, your diet in the proper alignment as how it should be, then you're going to have your optimal health. Thank you.